morning. Good morning. Test, test, test. How y'all doing this morning? Nice to see you out. Sorry, uh, there's not enough chairs here. It's always hard to uh, mix and match what, what some of our talks are going to have more, uh, more people to present, attend or not. Anyways, welcome to uh, B-Sides Day 2. Uh, this morning, we have uh, Mr. Roberto Salgado that's uh, presenting a, his talk, A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. Um, Roberto's going to talk about uh, exploring the latest social engineering techniques that are currently being used by criminals while going into some of the ways to defend against them. Roberto Salgado is the both founder and CTO of WebSec. He's from Victoria. Roberto and WebSec have also uh, been our sponsors from besides from, from uh, year one, and I'd like to thank him for that. Uh, Roberto's got lots of skills. He's a definitely a skilled pen tester, business developer. He's uh, also developed uh, and put work into such uh, known projects such as uh, Lib Injection, Mod Security, PHP IDS, SQL Map, Web Application of Obscification obs Book. <laughs> Roberto also created and maintains the SQL Injection Knowledge Base and a valuable resource for security researchers is one of the most comprehensive references available when dealing with SQL injections. Um, I'm just gonna cut that right nice and short. Thank you for being here. Roberto, take it off. Thank you, Darren. Thanks. So as Darren said, uh, I'll be talking about social engineering, uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing is the talk. Um, here we did a brief introduction of myself, but just to recap, uh, Roberto Salgado, co-founder of WebSec, uh, just a company that does information security services. Um, I've been a developer since I was a little kid. Uh, last four years or so, I've been uh, developing a lot in Python. Recently, I just started learning Golang, great language. And uh, there's my contact info if you ever need to get in touch with me. Here's a brief overview of the topics we'll be seeing. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, so yesterday, I had like probably like 50 slides, and today I have 115 slides. So I have 114. So let's, it's going to be a lot of stuff. So I was thinking maybe we'll just, uh, if we have time, we'll do the questions at the end. But if anyone has questions throughout the presentation, just feel free to ask me, interrupt me if you need to. Um, so these are some of the different kinds of social engineering that we see. I'm not really going to explain them. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with most of these. Um, can anyone think of maybe a technique that's not on the list of social engineering? Yeah, that's a, a good one. And I do touch on vishing later. I just didn't include it in the list. <laughs> yeah, you can keep on hitting on the ishing variations. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's just go for it. <laughs> so why should we care about social engineering? Well, I mean, social engineering has probably been around since humans of it's just a way of uh, deceiving someone or, or tricking someone in a way that will benefit you in a certain way. Um, and so it's a super common point of entry these days for uh, data breaches, as you'll see. And, and uh, evidence shows that social engineering is probably actually trending. So it says that 91% of cyber attacks uh, can start the breach with a phishing email. I got a lot of these graphs from the Verizon um, data breach investigative report from 2016. It explains a lot more on these graphs. Um, so if you're interested in it, I'd recommend taking taking a read through that, it's a pretty good uh, report. Um, so yeah, you can see that hacking is still used quite a bit um, and just everything else breaches. So the category didn't really fall into anything specific, but just in general. And uh, social engineering is right below it. But then if we look at, um, for example, attacks used in cyber espionage, uh, social engineering is huge in cyber espionage. Um, phishing is still like the third, almost you know 70% there. And then we see two other forms of social engineering, like pretexting, and even bribery comes down. Is a, even though it's very low, it does happen. And even um, with web attacks, we can see that social engineering, phishing in particular, is also really high up there. When uh, companies in the US and Europe were, were asked, what do you think your biggest threat might be, 81% in the US and 83 in, in Europe stated that social engineering was probably one of their biggest threats that they, they face. And then if you look at the number of phishing sites that's discovered monthly all the way from 2007, and this goes up to only 2012, but you can see it's a, a huge spike. And a few more graphs just to really support my, my theory that phishing is trending. Um, you can see the social aspect here and the number of breaches, the threats uh, that are here. Social is, is quite up there too, as we can see with other graphs. Uh, it's 
kind of in third place here. Same with this one. This is a little harder to follow. There's so much going on. But social is being the pink one. It starts in, down here. It goes up. has a little spike. But you see it's, it's going up slowly up here, especially from where it was 2015 to like 2010. It's really gone up in the last five years. So are we a target? Like, I know, like, you think phishing, maybe it's only for, like, CEOs of companies or, you know, other people. Like, maybe the average day person isn't going to be a target, but there's really always something that they can get out of you. Um, if you just look at this image, uh, you see, like, maybe they can host malware on your computer or uh, pirate software, pornography. They can use your, your machine to send out spam. Um, they can obtain uh, sensitive information from your computer. If they compromise your email, then they can use like uh, business email attacks, BC attacks, where they pretend to be from inside the company and, and maybe ask for finance for money. Um, they can try and steal like proprietary software from your computer, uh, hijack your social uh, your social sites, um, get your banking information, install ransomware on your computer. I mean, th there's just an endless amount of reasons why someone would want access to your computer, even if you don't even have money or like banking information. They might just use it to send out spam or to pivot their, their attacks for, for other uh, machines that they'll compromise. So why, did, why does social engineering even work in the first place? I think it really like, uses, uh, relies on human emotions and weaknesses. These are some of the ones I thought of that um, I see often in social engineering attacks. They take advantage of these certain uh, emotions, I guess. And um, with all my talks, I always have to include an XKCD comic. Kind of funny. So, fishing license, apply here. It's like, hi, I'd like to apply for a. You're under arrest. And he's like, okay, I should have seen that coming. But then, if you highlight on the text, it comes out later. He's like, later, walking out of the jail and posting ten thousand dollar bail. Wait, this isn't, isn't even the street the county jail is on. <laughs> so that guy was fished. <laughs> um, there's just some quick historical examples. You, I mean. You could say that maybe like Adam and Eve was social engineered by the snake, right? When <laughs> they're they're tricked to uh, <laughs> take a bite of the apple. Uh, of course, you can think of the horse, the Trojan horse. Um, and I'm, there's like you know I've heard people have heard of the Ponzi scheme that was back in the 20s. Um, there's a guy who actually tried to sell like the Eiffel Tower. He'd tell tourists that <laughs> that he'd sell them the Eiffel Tower or, or bits of it. Um, there's that movie, Catch Me If You Can, with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm sure some of you have seen it, too. This is based on Frank Abigail, who's like a, it's a real story. And what he, when he was interviewed later, they asked him, um, so how do you do it? How, how does it work? And he says, like, if you dress the part and play the part, people will believe it, that you belong in that part. So a lot of times he'd, he'd maybe dress up as a, a captain for like an airline, and then he'd get free flights, you know, travel around. Um, Kevin Mitnick's another big one in social engineering. More recent, um, he was around a lot when I was growing up, uh, especially in, like in the early '90s and stuff. He was like the king of social engineering back then. Uh, and then there's like Bernie Madoff, of course. He's kind of like the modern day Ponzi, and a few other ones. You know, the Target. They got into their HVAC contractor through a phishing email, I think. And that ended up being one of the biggest breaches, uh, database or credit card breaches in history. Uh, this guy's awesome, so he wanted to go see his favorite band, and uh, he went backstage, and right before he went up uh, to the bouncer, he modified the band's wiki page, because it wasn't like locked or restricted. Anyone could modify it. So he just modified it quickly and added himself as a family member of the band. So to get in, he just showed the bouncer on the wiki page that he was a family member. They let him in, and I guess the band was so uh, impressed with that technique that they ended up taking photos with him and having some drinks. Uh, I was just reading this article like a month ago or so. A guy that, that in the 2005, he, he managed to uh, sneak into the, the Oscars. Um, and kind of based on what I was just saying, he, he, when he asked, he said, I put on my best black suit and tie, combed my hair back, and completely sober, walked up to the Kodak Theater. Um, they're just people. I can be one of them. So he just played the part, and people believed him. And he was able to get through very sec uh, like three or four security barriers and actually got in and then took pictures of Chris Rock and a few other uh, Hollywood stars. Um, of course, more recently with the DNC hack, and kind of embarrassing that uh, John Podesta was hacked through a phishing email for his Google uh, email account, like Gmail. 
And uh, I can show you a quick demo of just like a phishing email here. This one's going around, it's been going around quite a bit lately. I saw it a few years and I saw a comeback of this. So this is just my Gmail. I, I prepared this last night, so I don't have the internet on this computer right now. Um, so here's like an attachment, or what looks like to be an attachment, but it's not really an attachment. It's an image that looks like it's an attachment with a PDF on it, but it has a link that redirects the user somewhere else. Um, so I'll have my Thunderbird here. If you can look at the link right below, and it wouldn't appear, it looks like it's going to a Google page, but this is just a, a little trick. The real page is my evilcorp.com page. If you can see it has a little at symbol right there, that means that all of this is just like a login, like a username, password type thing, and then this is the actual domain where it's going. But it makes it seem like it, it's really going to accounts.google.com. And I, I was showing you my Thunderbird because it shows you the full link in Thunderbird, but if I look at the Gmail, put my mouse over it, uh, it will take it will take out the credential part and it just show me the actual domain, Evil Corp. So Evil Corp is just a, a, a host name I set up in my local local computer. I actually should probably start WAMP server here. So when the user gets this email, he's like, oh, check, check out the sweet attachment. They click on it, and this is doing a redirect to my server. It did it really quickly there. It went to Evil Corp on my local host and redirected it to a data protocol. So instead of like an HTTPS protocol you're using, you, there's a data protocol. And then it's saying to, uh, it, it could be a typed text HTML. So then again, this is, makes it look like it's actually like on Google's domain, but this is actually just text that's there. Um, if you move all the way here, you'll actually see a script tag, and the script tag, which uses, again, the data protocol, it's base64 encodes the payload. This is the actual, the entire uh, web page is, is hidden in that base64 string. So I just could do this again quickly so you can see, because it re happens really fast. People, person gets an attachment, they might, you know, click on it not thinking twice about it. Oh, redirect, ask them to sign in. Once they actually sign in, the credentials are stolen for that Gmail account. It's kind, of, it's kind of a tricky one. Unfortunately, the one that Podesta uh, fell for was much simpler, I think. I try not to move around much. I'm supposed to stay in this little square here. Um, a few more real life examples. I thought this one was great because what Russia did, according to this story, is they wanted to get into NATO headquarters. Um, so what the, they wanted to get specifically, specifically into this air gap machine, meaning it had no access to the internet. So what they did is there was a bunch of uh, re retail stores around. They supplied all those retail stores with infected USB drives, knowing that eventually someone from the NATO headquarters would go to one of these stores and buy a USB, plug it into the computer, and eventually it, it got access that way. So pretty sneaky. Um, the FBI, this one goes back to 1971. <laughs> uh, they really wanted to break into the FBI headquarters, but the door was always locked, and apparently lock picking it was not an option. So they kindly uh, left a note on the door asking them not to lock it. And by, surely enough, when they showed up, the door wasn't locked, and they were able to just get in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they stole a secret, selective secret service records and left. <laughs> wow. Um, and then in the media all the time, when I was preparing this talk, uh, back, like a basic version of this talk back in 2016. Um, I was just looking at the news and within like two weeks I saw like so many articles with phishing and just uh, scamming and social engineering in general. PayPal phishing is a huge one. Um, attackers are usually trying to fish with PayPal because even if they can get it uh, in a PayPal into a PayPal account and they don't get financial information, um, there still can be uh, a lot of sensitive information like maybe a banking number or something, or a social security number, something that can, they can use to gain access to other accounts. Um, target phishing, you know, if they get, the, like again, maybe they get your, uh, your address through um, PayPal or some other website they hack, and then they start sending you more targeted attacks. Uh, this is huge, so BEC, 
you know, where someone pretends to be the CEO and then emails his CFO, for example, asking them to wire, you know, so much money to like a, an account in China. And I guess this is from April 16. So FBI said that 2.3 billion had been lost. Um, by the time, by June uh, 2016, it had gone up to 3.1 billion. So I mean, we, sh we can see that b business email compromise is also trending. One of the worst cases was a, a CFO who ended up transfer transferring $44.6 million. And um, that, that example, that first one, the Chinese scammers, uh, Tecmato, I think they're like a game toy company, right? I think what, they, what happened with these guys is uh, they sent it like on Friday, but since it was the weekend, they sent the money, but it was on Friday, it was the weekend, so the, the money can't, couldn't go through until Monday. So they're able to contact the bank in China and get the money back. Uh, that was really lucky of them. So uh, Krebs, um, Brian Krebs, he's an investigative journalist. He's like the Sherlock Holmes of the internet for getting bad guys. He's amazing some of the, the stuff he finds. Um, this is kind of an, he has a, a whole section on business email compromise examples. Um, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of insurers won't cover you if you get uh, scammed through phishing or social engineering because that was kind of your fault, they say. Um, this is one of the examples of how these business email compromises go. You know, they always ask it to be strictly confidential, take priority over a task, so it, like it's do it now fast, so not give them time to think about it. They said they asked if they had been contacted by the attorney from KPMG. Um, that it's very sensitive, only communicate with me, you know, don't don't speak with anyone else about this. And then they later had someone later call pretending to be this uh, KPMG attorney actually contact the person to the phone. Um, and you can see the link about it where like this firm actually tried to sue the insurer insure over $48,000, $480,000 that they had lost. And um, since January 2016, it says that um, BC has uh, witnessed a, a, a huge increase, <laughs> as you can see. And here you can kind of see um, where BC is uh, more predominant. And you can, the hotspot is obviously like US, Brazil, Australia, but Canada is growing too. Um, it's getting up there. And unfortunately, um, most of the targets are the higher executives in that company for uh, these BC attacks. So like the CFO, CEO. And whenever I've done a social engineering engagement with my clients, Every time they ask me not to target the CEO, CFO, they're out of the test. Like they don't want to get messed with, right? They don't want their daily operations messed with or anything. So sometimes these guys are the least trained or least aware of how to prevent or recognize these attacks and they're the most targeted. So hopefully that'll change. Um, so this talk is gonna focus mostly on phishing because it is one of the more prevalent forms of social engineering. And part of that is to, uh, because of how easy it is to kind of execute. If I look at my spam email, or my spam folder in my email, um, this was back in 2016. Well, you can see about the dates right there, actually. All of these attachments are like Word documents or Excel sh sheets um, with macros, like, malicious macros trying to hack me. <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny because I was taking a look at my email like last night or two nights ago and I noticed that there's hardly any attachments now. So Gmail has stepped up their game and they start detecting and blocking a lot of these macros that people are sending. Even when I've tried to do tests, if my macro isn't fully undetectable and Google detects it, it'll, it won't even send it, send the email, it just blocks it right away. So I did see, I did notice two that had attachments, so I decided to look at these quickly. And these both attachments were HTML files that were attached. Um, that bottom one, the HTML file that had included was this fake phishing site, it asked you for your name, you know, your social security number, credit card details, everything they can get. Uh, taking a look at the HTML code, you can see some stuff re referencing like Gnalytics, uh, more Gnalytics, but I can see like a weird hash there and then F validator. Uh, what well, turns out, this is actually a key. It's decrypting this data. Um, very suspicious. I, I prettified the HTML so you can see it better. Um, 
and then running just this functions in the console to see what it gave back. This is the actual compromised sites, uh, state chain, and this is the PHP uh, script where it's sending all that information that I put in through a post request. Um, I, I got this one last year in my email. I, I noticed it was kind of targeting Canadians. I know a few other Canadians, I think Colin had gotten it. Um, it's kind of funny. Uh, because it says macro C's, like if it was like Gollum or Smeagol or something. <laughs> uh, this is kind of what the the macro looked like for this one. And if I scan this with a uh, virus total or no no distribute, I can't remember which one. Uh, yeah, this is no distribute, and it got detected by 16 out of the 35 AVs, um, which I scanned it with. Even though this this email had been going around forever. I mean, it's good that 16 AVs are detecting it, but you'd hope that the detection rate would be higher, you know, closer to 100. So, I mean, I could send this old macro to people and it'd still work, but if you're using one of these AVs, they didn't detect it. Uh, another more interesting one is I got like an SMS from Rogers. Um, well, what seemed to be Rogers, it came from a thousand number. So a lot of people don't know that you can easily spoof numbers, like you can spoof emails too. Um, and I had a bit of trouble with this one, I wasn't sure, because I had this website, and I was trying to figure out if it was real or not. Uh, and I go into the website, everything looks pretty real. But once I looked a little closer into it, it turns out it was a fake. So I reported this to, to Rogers and just put big PD there, why not? And uh, luckily I checked it like a month later and the site had been taken down. So that was a good thing. Um, Something I'm starting to see a little bit more too is uh, phishing on OSX. So maybe six months ago, I probably didn't see any macros that worked on on, on Mac. Um, within the last month or two, I've been seeing tons of them. And because they're kind of fairly new to the macro game, I guess, they have a really low detection rate. And apparently uh, Office 2011 doesn't have a sandbox or anything, but it makes it really easy to backdoor and elevate your privileges on. Um, my business partner, Paulino Calderon, he's been doing some research um, in these Mac macros and was kind enough to share this video with me of this new attack he's been working on. So he opens the, the doc, and before the doc even opens, it asks him to put in his Apple ID password to, just to view the doc before anything has even loaded. Once he put it in, if you look at the Wireshark, the credentials were captured and, and sent to uh, through HTTP. Just a GET request on this, for, for the example. So we're gonna look a little bit of how social engineering is done, how, like how we can maybe uh, do some tests in-house with our employees, or if you want, you know, just some in-house training you could set up, or if you're doing this for an engagement. Um, these are some phishing toolkits and frameworks that are curr currently exist. Uh, I'm not really gonna go into them much. I haven't really tested them or used any of them myself, but it's definitely a quick way to kind of get uh, engagement set up. They have a bunch of templates you can use. They can automate a bunch of the process. There's also phishing as a service if you don't really wanna <laughs> set up your own phishing. <laughs> the only website I kind of knew about this was this fake game uh, Russian site. Uh, I don't know if it's still active or not. It redirected me to like this admin URL but it says there's a total of like a million hijacked accounts or something, and that you can get uh, Steam, online tanks, and different other accounts. Uh, there's some other types of tools. I mean, I was looking at tools for phishing in social engineering, there was like hundreds, so I only included a very limited set. I found this Snap R one kind of interesting. I haven't tested it yet, but um, it was just presented at Black Hat, I guess, and according to them, uh, it, it uses machine learning to like target like social media, social media like Twitter sites and based on what someone tweets, it will like adapt to what they like and then target them with a, a social engineering attack based on that. And according to them, it gets two out of three people. There's SET, which is the social engineering toolkit. Um, this is great for a variety of social engineering attacks uh, by David Kennedy Relic. Uh, although it's pretty popular, so it might get detected. You might have to modify certain things so it doesn't get detected. Then there's a few that uh, you can do like social engineering or phishing through um, Wi-Fi. 
So if I set up like a fake access point, and then I did now have service your Wi-Fi so that you connect to mine, um, I can present you with fake sites, which you might think is real. And then there's the, you know, like Teensy or like HID, when you plug in a USB and it acts as a keyboard or a mouse. So like, before computers had problems with like USBs that had the auto run, so you'd plug in a USB auto run and the malware would automatically run. Windows ended up changing that, so you can't just auto run stuff anymore with a normal USB. So what you can use is you can plug in a USB that pretends it's a keyboard or a mouse, and you program all these commands for it to do. So it might like open a command prompt just by clicking the start menu, like typing command, and then opening the command prompt, and then execute a bunch of code that way. These are some tools that can help you create uh, attacks of that style. So something you want to do is like open source intelligence to like research your target before executing the social engineering attack. Um, there's many publicly available sources. Uh, of course, social uh, networks like Google, Facebook, looking at the person's LinkedIn is always good. Uh, company website can sometimes host the per like emails and positions and names of the people, employees working there, so that's always good. And sometimes as a last resort, you can use like the dark web, or you can even pay for a credit check on someone, and you can get like their phone number, or their address. So attack is use this all the time to like get celebrities phone numbers and addresses is they just pay for like fifty, sixty dollars for a credit check online and suddenly they have all that person's information. And again, just a few tools that could help kind of help you uh, research people. Um, looking at the dark web as I was saying, now that tax season is coming up, you can buy a bunch of uh, tax data on many Americans. There's, they have like literally like almost every American in their database is millions. And this has other information like SSN numbers and other stuff that could be really useful for even targeted phishing. Uh, I know there's even like they've hacked social security databases and then the Russians sell the, these databases uh, for very cheap. You can buy like a social security number for a dollar or two dollars. And in some websites use social security numbers as like validation for to prove your identity. Um, talking about like the business email compromise earlier, in this attack, this person tried to get a copy, a W-2 copy of the entire employees of the company. I think uh, it didn't work for him, but this is kind of what his, his message looked like when he sent it out. So once we've researched the target, we have to figure out how are we going to deliver the payload to this target? What's the the best way to kind of get, get them to open my tack or what would work best. So you have to consider what you know about the target, what method might raise the least amount of suspicion, and identify what your strengths are and weaknesses and, and practice on that, build on that. Um, some forms that you could go in person, like in the office, and uh, you know, pretend you're delivering flowers or something, or over the phone, you could pretend uh, you're the, your ISP and that they have, you detected malware coming from their network, or that you can give them a free upgrade somehow and they have to provide certain information for that. Um, so just as Kevin was saying earlier, there's vishing. Um, what's good about vishing is that, you know, generally you don't really need uh, technical knowledge. Say maybe the only technical knowledge you might use is if you're spoofing your phone number. And this is actually really common in vishing. Like, there's some people, especially like, there's a story recently I read on Krebs that led me to this other story on Wired, which I highly recommend. It's from 2012, but it talks about this, I guess he was like 15 years old at the time, a hacker that went by the name Cosmo, and he developed a bunch of social engineering attacks where he'd call companies and he could get into almost anyone's account just through calling the person and, and uh, getting them to reset the password, for example. Um, he actually ended up hacking Cloudflare, the CEO, just so he could redirect the channel for 4chan to his, their Twitter account for a few minutes. And that was quite the, 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 the stunt, because uh, the CEO of Cloudflare had two-factor authentication on, and they had they'd figured out a way to bypass that too. It's on the, in the article, so I recommend reading it if you want to learn more about it. So I invited a few of the world's best hackers to try to hack me and show me where my vulnerabilities are. 
And now I'm going to meet them in Las Vegas for DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year. At DEF CON, they have the they using social uh, engineering, which is essentially hacking without any right code. There. They just use a phone and an internet connection. Do you want to do a sample of vishing call? What's vishing? Vishing is voice solicitation. And basically, um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. OK. There's a spoofing technique. Another technique is to have the crying Hi, baby in the I'm background. Actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me OK? I, my baby. The person on I'm the phone sorry. will sympathize with that person. <laughs> my, might help them out more. <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby. And he's like, get this done by today. So I'm so sorry. I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, At Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah, well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number. 5127. To set up her own personal access to my account. So Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no the password account. on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right, thank you. Holy shit. So Holy they, shit is right. They just gave, they just gave you <laughs> it's unbelievable how common this is and happens software. all the time. Even with eBay, Amazon, like all these sites, you know, you think they would have your back. All it took was. So that's vishing. Another method is baiting. Um, according to research, 76% of people plug an unknown USB device into the computer. Holy shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's um, like tricks, you know, like I was saying, you could send a secretary or or whatever, like maybe a bouquet of flowers, USB flowers, <laughs> pretending to be from a romantic lover. And how can you resist not plugging that in and seeing what it's all about? Uh, there's also some USB device. The moment you plug them in, they'll just fry your computer and destroy it. Like, they'll fry the motherboard. Uh, they have like capacitors that hold charge. And the moment you just plug it in, it unleashes all that charge into your computer, and your, your, your computer's done. Anyone here watch uh, Mr. Robot? Okay, so you've probably seen this. But I think it's a great example. So, you know, I'll break into the police headquarters, so Arlene is dropping a bunch of USB infected with uh, religious payloads. Someone pointed it out to me yesterday, like, you only picked up one, it's like 20 USBs there, you know? Nice enough to leave some for other people. It's very common to you see fishing sites, you know, offer you free music, free movies and stuff. Here the malware is already executed in the background. And there it's detected. Connection closed by remote host. Elliot but we had a fish. Connection. I was in. The exploit started to run and then. Did you write that exploit yourself? Had an hour. What, you just pulled code from Rapid9 or some shit? Rapid9, right? <laughs> What's well, interesting too about that video is how the, the officer, once he realizes that he's been infected, he just unplugs his computer and shuts it off. In a real attack, you don't usually want to do that because if there's any evidence in memory, you lose all the evidence in memory. 
Uh, you can unplug it from the internet and stuff and, and you know, call a security professional maybe to get a, a memory dump at least so they can kind of figure out what was happening there. So the other method, which is probably the most used, is the email payload auxiliary. Again, because it's like, you know, extremely easy to do, doesn't cost anything, um, really low risk of being caught, and you can target a mass amount of people over your emails to like a, a spam or phishing campaign. According to the research, is 13% of people clicked uh, on phishing attachments, and that the median time of a click is very short. My personal uh, uh, experience, it's been a bit higher than this, but I'm doing a bit more targeted spear phishing. This is more generic, I guess. Um, so if you want to, I mean, send your payload through email, you have the option of setting up your own email server, which can be a pain in the ass, because uh, sometimes if you just set up a new server for your email, it's not, it hasn't been whitelisted, it's not like approved, you know, it's just like a random server. But if you do want to go this way about it, um, I saw this script mail server set up, which helps you, there's a git for it, it helps you automate this process of setting up your mail server. These are the things it kind of does for you. Uh, we used to do this back in the day, not using this tool, but setting up our own mail servers, and it was just so much a hassle every time. Sometimes our emails wouldn't go through, and the SPF wasn't right, or it was always an issue or another. So what we started doing is using like cloud email providers. So um, one that we've been using a lot recently was the Outlook 365. So we, maybe we'll buy a domain through GoDaddy, and GoDaddy gives you the, op the option of including the email account through the Outlook 365. Um, and then, you know, <laughs> Microsoft is whitelisted. They're, trusted, they're a trusted email provider, so if you use them, there's a higher chance of your email will go through. Apparently, spammers are also using warm-up accounts, so these are like fake accounts that they created, which they'll send the emails, the spam, to first, and since no one complains because they own all these accounts, it, it gets trusted by the Gmail's account or whatever. So then you can send it to the real targets and it won't be blocked at that point. Um, so mostly, if we look at uh, this graph here, uh, the biggest threat is uh, attachments. People are sending attachments to their emails. And then the second one would be like a web drive or an email link, sending a link that would later have the malware once they click on it and reach, reach it. If we take a uh, look quickly at what's being sent, I mean, docs are being sent quite a bit because Still, a lot of people don't know that you can get hacked through a Word document or like an Excel document, even a potentially a PowerPoint. Um, you know, just open it, enable macros, you're hacked. A lot of people are just starting to send uh, your J, uh, JavaScript files directly because if you open a JavaScript file on Windows, Windows will use C script or W script, which is a native tools to for Windows to actually run JavaScript on the OS. Sometimes they'll just send up the VBS to just the straight up uh, Visual Basic documents. Um, so ransomware, it's pretty big. <laughs> if you look uh, at the discoveries of ransomware from 2005, where there was maybe only one or two, you know, to up to 2012, to going all the way to 2016, where in the first quarter of 2016, there's almost as many variants as the entire 2015. It's just exploding. So another graph that just backs me up here. Ransomware has spiked 752% in 2016. Uh, so it's one of the biggest threats today. But if we look at what attackers are actually sending, um, they're sending C2s, the so command and control uh, malware. So they, I mean, this way they still have control of the computer and they can maybe mine for credentials, for, for banking details. And then if nothing works, they could always throw the rans ransomware on top later, right? Others just directly do the ransomware, and then some will have like key loggers or back doors. Uh, Trend Micro stated that ransomware detection was around 1%. There's so many new variants coming out and, and changes like, a lot of people use one ransomware, two, you know, gets detected, they already have a new one coming out that they've programmed, and it's not detected by AV. So uh, detection rates are pretty low for ransomware. And people are doing it because, I mean, almost everyone will pay the ransom. I mean. I'm guessing, I've, I've just heard stories of so many ransomware attacks and they always pay the ransom. So if we could pick a domain to execute our attack from, like maybe for our email or send them to a link, um, there's many uh, things we can consider for the domain, like omitting certain characters or, or swapping uh, letters. 
um, putting a dot in the wrong place or missing a dot, um, bit flipping, using a different TLD, so if the website uses .com, sometimes we'll register the same exact website, but we'll use a .org or .net and send our emails from that. Um, sometimes it can be confusing with certain pr companies. For example, if you get an email from Facebook, they send the, the mail from facebookmail.com, or like if you get one from Yahoo, it's from yahooinc.com. It's not coming from the original domain. So that can confuse users sometimes, and then maybe like you can use the same idea for your attacks, register something that's similar. A lot of websites are starting to use uh, certificates, um, SSL, T TSL. Um, with Let's Encrypt, Let's Encrypt is an organization that provides free certs for your website. I think that you have to renew it every three months or so. But according to someone's research, is uh, there is like 709 certificates that have been registered with the key keyword PayPal. So obviously these are phishing sites, and then there's, there's other with Bank of America, Apple, Amazon, you know, and all these other sites that uh, attackers are starting to SSL their, their websites, their phishing sites, because it gives them a bit more credibility. And even in some training courses to prevent these attacks, I've seen people say, like, look at the, the green pad. You know, if it's green, then it's probably safe, you're good to go, but it's not true because the attackers are using that now too. And you can see here's an example of this one that uses the Let's Encrypt. Um, and here's an Apple one that's also uh, certified. So for, again, getting back to picking your domain, uh, there's a tool that can help you out with that, Zero Crazy. It talks about all the, that list I just mentioned with the vowel swapping, the missing the dots. So you put in a website, for example, like example.com here, and it'll give you all these different variations. Um, I was just seeing a new tool DNS twist, it does exactly the same thing, it seems like. So here, he's trying it with Amazon.com. And it can actually check to see if the website's available or not, or if it's been registered. So it gives you different variations, and then you can kind of get a visual look to see what would be more, most confusing or look more similar to the real site. Uh, homolith attacks, so Unicode characters that look very simil similar to the real character, but it's a completely different character. Um, Adrian or Iron, Iron Geek has a, a generator you can use for like generating these different Unicode attacks that look similar. And here's just an example. Um, this guy put in Skype.com for the website. That K is not a real K, that's a Unicode uh, character that looks like a K, but it's not a K. Or with Slack, he used a K too. Um, so if someone registered this domain and then sent you an email from that, it might be really hard to tell that it's not the real Slack. In uh, Unicode, they're aware of it, the consortium. They have, uh, in their docs, they have uh, visual security issues and where they talk about this. Um, Unicode attacks aren't, aren't, aren't restricted to just like the domains. Um, you can use Unicode for other stuff. There's a really interesting character known as the mirror character, or it's the left to right override, right to left override, um, wh where you can like, it, you, you can give it a, a string of text and it'll flip it over, like if you're looking at it through a mirror. So, there's a few things to look at here. This looks like, it has the extension of a, a, a JPEG, right? Um, but it's really an executable. I just have the mirror character placed right in there. So if you look at the properties for this, the word properties has actually been reversed um, because of this mirror character, that's properties right there. But even though it looks like a JPEG, it's still an uh, executable, it's still an application. And if we uh, do an LS in uh, DOS, you can see a question mark there because it can't represent that Unicode character, so it just, it just puts a question mark in its place and it shows the proper extension of the .exe. Let's look at a quick demo of this. So character map is included in pretty much every version of Windows as far as I know. You just type char map in your thing and it'll come up. So what we're looking for is that left character and there's a few of them, so don't get confused. It's like the left to right mark, then you have the 
left to right embedding, but you want the override character. So double click that to copy it. And then let's just pretend this, uh, this is a file name, for example. If I were to put the Unicode character right in here, it flips everything over and it makes it seem like a JPEG. And then I could change the icon to make it look like a JPEG too. I mean, Windows by default doesn't even show you the extensions, but in the case that they did, <laughs> enable extensions. So now, you know, make it seem, just because that Unicode character is right in there, it makes it seem like it's a JPEG, but it's not. Um, next, you need your command and control center. So if you're expecting to like take over someone's computer, you need a two-way communication with that computer. Um, you know, we, we usually just get any server. You can do AWS, apparently with Amazon. If you're doing pen testing, you need to uh, get permission beforehand by like listing what IPs you're, you're gonna be testing and stuff like that. But if you're just using it for command and control center, they don't seem to care. Like, they don't block you at all. You can set up a interpreter um, or an empire, for example, and it's fine, you can use that. I mean, you can use any cloud server, whatever. I, I like to use Metasploit, but there's also PowerShell. Uh, Metasploit's great because, I mean, there's a community edition which is free. It, it has a lot of uh, support. Um, it's, really, it's been around forever, so it's pretty reliable. Um, it's multi-platform. You can run it on Mac, you know, Linux, uh, Windows. And uh, I like to use resource scripts, which is something it includes, which like, lets me automate quite a bit. And it's developed by Rapid7, like you might have heard earlier uh, in the video, they said Rapid9, which is a spoof on this Rapid7 company. And the nice thing about Empire, um, it's all PowerShell, so PowerShell is, has low detection. It runs a lot of memory, um, so it'll keep it pretty undetectable, but it, doesn't, it hasn't been around as long as Metasploit, so it might not be as reliable. Um, for creating your like template for your, your documents, uh, I would recommend looking at John Lambert's research. His Twitter's right there, but that's pretty much all he posts, and pictures of birds, which I actually enjoy too. Um, but he has a bunch of different templates and examples and techniques um, that you can copy or, or get used as an example. So if you wanna make your payload uh, fully undetectable to antivirus, because I mean that's important these days, like I was just telling you, you can't even send it through uh, Gmail if it's detected. And then on, the, on their end, if their firewall or any IDS or antivirus system they have detects it, it will also get blocked. So it's really important that your attack is pretty undetectable if you wanna re have it reach your target. Um, if you look at, like just go through GitHub and type cryptors, packers, stuff like obfuscators. There's a bunch of like custom made code that people have done and uploaded it to GitHub, which you can use and it'll pretty much be undetectable because no one really knows about it for the most part. Uh, there's also like a Spanish website that I'm going to every now and then undetectables.net and they share a lot of uh, rats or cryptors or packers they use. Um, some of them are, you know, you have to be a long time member for them to, to, to give it to you, others, are just free, those will probably get detected pretty fast. Um, but then some have many challenges you have to solve in order to obtain the cryptor or whatever they're, they're giving you. So because it has this mini challenge, it makes it harder for anyone to just get it, even like a, a researcher or someone that works for an antivirus company, they might not be able to obtain a sample of this cryptor. Whereas if you do solve this mini challenge, you'll get it and it will remain uh, fully undetectable for much longer. A lot of attacks too are using a fileless attacks um, so all of attacks are just relying on Windows tools, like you can use Windows native tools um, to accomplish your attacks without having to have your custom malware. Um, so I mean, nothing detects Windows tools, right, because it's part of Windows. Um, and also a lot of attacks that are just in memory, especially like using PowerShell and other techniques, you can keep your attacks purely in memory, you never write to disk, and antiviruses won't, or have a really hard time detecting that. Uh, for exfiltration, you see a lot of DNS uh, exfiltration, and other like ARP, exfiltration, different uh, uncommon techniques are be becoming more common these days. And I've noticed um, there are certain vectors that still aren't that well detected. Um, like sometimes I have a macro that's detected in a Word document, but if I put it in an Excel sheet, something that's undetectable for some reason, I was saying OSX has low detection rate and there's other things. Um, so I, I 
I was saying I was learning like Python and, and Golang, so I, I decided to create um, some common, key, like some key loggers in these languages using very common techniques, like techniques that are used by every key logger. Compile these, scan them, zero detection rate for some reason. Uh, there's invoke obfuscation, which is a PowerShell obfuscator. It's a really cool tool. It really obfuscates all your PowerShell scripts. Um, so that may help to a certain degree to, uh, to bypass uh, like string detection, stuff like that. But if uh, AV is using heuristics, this is not gonna help that much. Um, for OS X, Office for Mac has the Mac script function, which seems to not really be detected much at all either. As I was saying, using Windows native tools is a good way to go about it. Um, Casey Smith, sub T, he has some really interesting techniques that you can use to bypass app locker and other protections, uh, UAC, and just weird, weird ways of using Windows tools to execute code or JavaScript. Um, so if you take a look at his techniques and implement them in your process, uh, a lot of bad guys already are, so they're becoming a little bit more detected, but it's still a way of uh, evading uh, detection. Another Windows tool is CertUto, which you can use to base64 stuff or, or unencode, code or unencode. So you can base64 your malware using this Windows tool and then unencode it to actually get it to run. This is a video, uh, again, Paulino sent me. Um, just doing his Mac research. So he started a, a meterpreter handler on the right side. He scanned his uh, macro. The thing about this to note is he hasn't obfuscated or done anything with his macro. It's just a macro for Mac. Um, it's even a doc M, which needs, means it needs a macro. Um, but zero obfuscation or anything, not really trying to evade AV, but ends up being fully indetectable, just, I guess, because it's Mac and it's too new or unseen before. So enables macros, and right away he gets the session and the interpreter there. There's also some tools that can help us generate our payloads. Um, I initially started using, uh, this was a small talk, a small talk at DerbyCon, uh, PS Gen, and I used that tool for like two years or three. I modified it slightly, um, but it's, it's now somewhat detected, so I stopped using it, uh, but it was great, because it, was, it wasn't really known enough the next year, like uh, Dave, David Kennedy um, gave a talk, or released the same kind of type of tool, Unicorn, but this one at the moment, like when it first came out, was really basic, didn't use any obfuscation or anything, and since uh, Relic is really well known, this was really detected easy, uh, whereas this one remains undetectable just because it was not, not as well known as this one. And there's a few other tools that can help you uh, just generate like your payloads for like these word macros or, and have them obfuscated to a certain degree so it's not fully detected. This is what my macro originally looked like using the PS exploit gen. Well, I mean the un unobfuscated version of it. Uh, so you could see what it's actually doing. And it just it checks to see if it, uh, the, the Windows is 64 or 32 bit, because it depends what version of PowerShell you can run based on that. It runs the PowerShell, and then it down downloads a script called invoke uh, shell code, I think it was, uh, which actually, yeah, invokes shell code, which runs any shell code you give it. So I generate a, a shell code uh, with mater uh, Metasploits to do a reverse HTTPS and then feed it to this uh, PowerShell script and it'll actually run that meterpreter shell code and give me a reverse HTTPS session. This SOAR encrypt is just a simple SOAR function to kind of encrypt all and obfuscate all the, all the data. This is what the obfuscated version looks like kind of hard to fit all in there. Um, and this works, again, like, it worked great until it got detected, so I made some modifications to it. These are like the differences. This is the original that was detected, and this was the modded version that became undetected. Um, sometimes just moving things around, I removed a bit of the obfuscation it had, like took it down a notch, and that um, eventually made it, you know, undetectable again. Um, you know, a few, like six months go by, suddenly it's detected again, like, oh God. So I created a much simpler version. Instead of using these tools, I just start from scratch, from zero. And I added a bit of obfuscation between like these function calls and stuff like that, but that, I don't think that's even necessary. Um, the main thing to look at is just the way I'm executing the, the code. I'm using like these Casey Smith techniques I was talking about, using native Windows tools. And I'm not running PowerShell right away. I'm running one thing that runs another thing that runs another thing. So this is like the line here that's really important. Um, using run DL32, which is used to run DLLs, but I'm using it to execute JavaScript. There's kind of a weird parsing uh, bug 
in Windows it's, it's known about, but you can use that. Um, so the JavaScript creates an ActiveX object, which then this ActiveX object will run the reg server 32, another a native win, Windows tool. I use this tool to download an XML file, which contains a PowerShell payload. The PowerShell payload is what you saw before, will download the invoke shellcode, and then the Metasploit shellcode is executed. There's a, descript, there's a explanation of why this thing works, the run DLL32 to execute JavaScript. We're not gonna jump into it right now, but pretty much it does some weird parsing ends up loading the MS HTML, goes into the run HTML application and loads this whole thing and executes it. This is the XML file that's retrieved. So here in this XML file, I actually have the PowerShell command, and this is the shell code for my interpreter right here. So I actually scanned this last night. You can see like 2.48 a.m. <laughs> I got zero out of 35 of this new macro I was playing around with. Kind of the funny thing when I was looking at it too, uh, there's like ads popping up here for like multiple exploits like docs, JS, VBS, all the stuff I was talking about, I'm like great. So I'm just gonna fire up my Kali here, see if I can get this demo quickly. Hopefully it fires up fast. monitor layout issues here. Um, I noticed another email that had gone through my, the filter, like Gmail's filter. I received a, 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 you know, I was showing you earlier, Gmail, you don't really receive attachments for documents anymore. But I received one, it was a docx, which was interesting, because docx can't have a macro. You either need it to be a doc or docm. And I scanned it, it had zero to 55 detection rate. So I was like, okay, this is interesting. I open it, and it has these three, like embedded, what seem to be docx in the document. It turns out there weren't docx. Once I click, right clicked on it and did properties, it was a VBS file, like a visual uh, basic script, um, which Windows will automatically run if you double click on it. So, um, looking at the code, it's all obfuscated. Just a bunch of garbage in there to confuse you. I removed all that garbage. Well, I mean, I scanned this thing first. Scanning the pure VBS file actually did get 12 out of 53. So I mean, that's not great, right? Um, yeah, for the Sophos guys, it's detected. I know there's a lot of Sophos people here. <laughs> um, here, I, I cleaned up the code. You can see the full, it was too long to fit on the screen, but you can see the, I put it on paste in there. Um, I noticed that it's calling this website here for change log. Um, I also, when I was looking at this, I looked at that URL, and apparently it had been involved in some other attacks, not only that one. So I looked at the location, it's uh, based in Russia. Um, looking at the history for this website, it's been like a bunch of porn sites and other raunchy stuff. And the sites detected by like one is malicious and the other one is a warning. Um, some other hurdles I faced is one, one organization I was targeting, um, they didn't allow websites that hadn't been categorized by their, their proxy, their blue, their blue coat. So what we did is we submit our, our phishing site to blue coat within under 24 hours they they accepted it. It was categorized as business economy. And really all the website had was, was an iframe to, to like a, another fake site and like an exploit pack or something malicious. So it was pretty easy to get it class, classified or categorized as a safe site when it wasn't. Um, so a few other tricks I've seen. Um, 
goes just quickly. So they get the subject to, to execute the command. They're getting the subject. They're, they're getting the subject property from the word document, which has the notepad.exe. So they're not including what they're going to execute right here, but they're including it within the subject of the document and then retrieving that information. Um, others will include like the payload within the document, but it's hidden. So if you highlight it and change the color, you can actually see the payload right there. Uh, another one that included the payload, basic 64 encoded, this is an executable, this uh, basic 64 encoded, and it's, it's just hidden in the comment section. You can't even see it there, but the malware later checks to see uh, for the comments and then gets that. You can see it's an MZ, so that's like a executable or something. Um, uh, some macros that are certified, uh, kind of interesting to start seeing that too. Uh, this macro has all these checks, you know, it checks the document name, see if it's been changed, checks for analysis tools being running, so if, it's, it, if it's in a VMware, um, if it's sandbox host names, you know, a bunch of things to know if it'll execute or not, basically try to uh, avoid being analyzed. This one uh, runs on a time, so if it's under that time, it'll execute, otherwise it doesn't. And there's other macros that are really targeted, like maybe if it's not that user, they'll check the user's email or user account, and if, not, if it's not that user that's targeting, it doesn't execute at all. So when you scan this with an antivirus, the heuristics won't detect it because it's not running as that user, so the, the malware doesn't execute at all. This one is kind of funny. Uh, I guess this John, John uh, Lambert was investigating this uh, macro, and the hacker started talking to him through like this little chat window. <laughs> so they had a bit of a conversation there. So let's hope this live demo is ready here. Just trying to get my Kali to show up on the screen here. One sec. I'm just gonna drag it over because it's being difficult. So I set up like a local network here with my VM. This is the IP for this. Um, using MSM, MSF Venom, you see the command, I, I generate a reverse HTTP. Um, it gives me the shell code, I cleaned it up a bit to put it in that XML file I was showing you earlier. Then for my command and control center, uh, I just run MSF console using this resource script, deployment.rc. What deployment.rc does, it sets up the reverse HTTP, it sets up my IP, the port 443. So it's reverse HTTP and I'm using port 443, so it just looks like normal uh, web HTTP tra traffic, it's encrypted too. Um, and then when the, I get a session, it will automatically run this auto run script. In the auto run script, just for an example, it, it uh, migrates processes, it gets sysinfo, um, get UID. I don't have a webcam in the VM, otherwise I'd take a webcam shot and then some keylog recording, okay? So, that's ready to go. This will be my victim machine here. So I didn't put in any content in the actual document, it just has the macros. Um, our command and control center is here set up and running, waiting for a connection. So the moment we enable macros, then it takes a second uh, the first time just because it's running all these processes and things. Check the macro quickly. I was doing this last night at four in the morning and it worked fine then, but. <laughs> I always put a password too on my uh, macros just to make it harder for someone to look at later. Unfortunately, I need to get the password from 
Key pass. <laughs> it's always weird typing your password in front of people. I'm sorry, I swear that. <laughs> okay, I know it's wrong. <laughs> Thanks for being patient with me. So it's that simple macro I got. I'm gonna try to run it again just directly from here. Oh, because I changed the auto run name, that's why. So I just ran the macro directly from here. not communicating with the machine for some reason. Oh, okay, I didn't have it on my private network. Now it's on the private network. Give it a sec. There we go, now it's communicating with the, his access. So let's just run this macro quickly one more time. Session open, there we go, woo. And now the research script starts running automatically. So without me having to touch it or be at the computer, it already mitigated uh, or migrated, sorry, <laughs> to, uh, or it's trying to migrate to Explorer here. It doesn't have a webcam, otherwise I'd take the screenshots and, and here it's recording keystrokes already. So if I do type something here, hi, how's it going? Or anywhere in the computer, right? Recording all my keystrokes. We could just view that quickly. Hi, how's it going? There, what did it just type, right? So that's a nice way of just automating uh, the process. It's all undetected by the AV or firewall for, for that case. Um, So I'll just wrap up quickly with some uh, solutions to kind of mitigate these things. How do we defend against this? Um, well, one study says that one of the problems is that uh, employees remain careless. I think it might, I mean, not only be careless, but maybe lack of awareness. They haven't been trained on these issues, so they don't know um, how to prevent them. From the book, Kevin Mitnick, the guy I was talking about earlier, he has the book, The Art of Deception, which is all social engineering, and it has some tips, like people inherently want to be helpful, so that's why they can be easily be duped. Um, sometimes they assume a certain level of trust, or say if I spoof a phone number and call from inside the company, they, they automatically trust that I'm inside the company. Or sometimes if I'm acting really angry sometimes, or pretending to be on the phone and, and yelling and shouting and stuff, to avoid conflict, someone might, even though maybe I'm, I'm in a restricted area, someone might want not to approach me and tell me I shouldn't be there just uh, to avoid that conflict when I'm really acting, pretending to be really mad. Uh, sometimes the information they think they're giving us uh, is innocuous, it's not gonna do anything, but we can use a little bit of information to maybe gather more information later. And sometimes just hearing a nice voice over the phone, you wanna help them out, right? Uh, there's this USG device, I haven't tried it out, but apparently it claims to have a firewall for USB devices for any like bad USB types of attacks. You can place this in the middle and then plug in your, your uh, Un untrusted USBs and they'll act as a firewall. And I haven't tested it myself, so I don't know. Just some general tips. Uh, you know, training and awareness is probably one of the biggest things you can do to uh, help prevent phishing attacks. If you have like posters around the office maybe, or in the environment, it can help be a constant reminder 
um, to like lock your computer, you know, don't click certain things. It's always good to have a policy in place and an instant response plan for if, if something does happen, you, you can act on it right away. Um, unique passwords is one of the biggest things I can tell you. Like our accounts are being compromised all the time. You can see uh, Troy Hunt's website, have I been pwned.com. According to your email, I'm sure it's there. Um, if you use, if you repeat your credentials on other websites, there's tools that are testing your credentials on all these different websites and services to see if you repeat it, uh, your, your password or your username to gain access to these other accounts. Um, keeping your systems updated and patched is always a huge thing, of course, and following best security practices. Uh, there's this website, gotfish.com, where you can report incidents to. If you detect a phishing site or something, you can go there and it has a bunch of resources. Um, another huge mitigation is removing admin rights from the user, like don't let users install their own software. Um, when I compromise a computer through these techniques, um, most users have admins, so I don't even have to escalate privileges. I can right away get their credentials, like maybe using Mimikatz, I can get their credentials in plain text from memory. Uh, it just makes it really easy once I have an admin, and it, I can pivot laterally throughout the network after that. Um, you can see this graph that shows mitigation, so if you just removing software installs, it's one of the easiest things to do, and uh, you can get like a 15 times improvement. Um, if you're training and preventing social phishing attacks, that would be like a 25 times improvement for your security. And again, just remember it takes a lot of practice, patience, and continuity. You have to always keep on going, doing it. I mean, you can't just give like a one training course, you know, every five years and expect them to remember that or for new employees. You know, you probably want to do it more continuous, like six months or every year or so. But if you keep on, you know, fighting off those pesky attackers, eventually you'll get there. And uh, <laughs> that's that. I didn't get any questions. Maybe I just wasn't paying attention. So if anyone has questions, feel free to ask right now, or you can ask me after. I know it's lunch, so probably people are hungry. <laughs> no? Well, thank you very much. Uh,